Hi folks, welcome back. I'm Woody and in this Moss Trooper episode we'll be back in the workshop with some more mini sport modifications and some interesting experiments. With the arrival at last of summer in Scotland it was time to swap the bubble canopy for the soft top, the air conditioned option, and we saw that in the Western Wanderings with you. The downside of the open cockpit has sometimes been a little too much fresh air and the occasional problem keeping the rain out. When the sun's out and I'm at low level, then the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. The view's superb and the temperature's comfortable, and provided I have a scarf, I can live with a draft around the back of my neck, most of the time anyway. If it's overcast, damp, or otherwise cold, then the arrangement isn't too good. I get a fair amount of buffeting, and over the last couple of years I've tried a few ways to reduce that issue. Part of the problem has been that the windscreen just isn't big enough. It looks sleek and in scale with the rest of the aircraft, but as you can see from this shot, it allows a lot of the aft bulkhead to get hit by the slipstream and it really isn't tall enough. I initially modified the design by adding side panels and I documented that in one of the earlier videos. It wasn't enough to stop the turbulence around my head, that which was caused by the slipstream anyway. I was having to wear more clothes in the summer than I wore in the winter. I tried modifying the area around the bulkhead, I used the off-cut from the original canopy to make another extension behind my head. It looked good on the ground, but it didn't perform well in the air, and as you can see here, it was vibrating fit to tear itself away. I took it off before it did the job itself, and potentially hit the tail on the way by. So, I needed a better plan. This was the original design. A bit of work with the pencil suggested that this might be better. I even considered how I might make a sliding canopy which would be the ultimate solution for all conditions. As summer turned to autumn, the storms arrived together with the rain of monsoon proportions. Since not even an army of ditch diggers could drain the swamp, sorry, the runway, it seemed like the ideal time to get into the workshop and do some tinkering. I began by making a cardboard model of what I hoped would be a better windscreen. I did a trial fit around the existing glazing to get everything lined up and assessed. As you can see, the modified screen is considerably taller and wider, and I also wanted to contour the side panels to match the curve of the rear fuselage so I could get some better street light, and it would look better too, I thought. To do that, the side panels would need to be shaped, and this would make framing and bracing difficult. Could I make the screen in one piece, I wondered? I experimented a bit with some scraps, uh, but to do that I needed a former to mould the glazing around, so I made one up out of scrap plywood. The contour of the side panels was traced from the rear bulkhead and the softwood frames made to support the hot glazing while it cooled to the correct shape, or so I hoped. All I had to do now was cut the perspex. Right, here we go then. Yeah, cutting acrylic. Straightforward enough recommend that you get something like this which is a scriber not so much a cutter it's just going to cut a slot a groove into the acrylic which will allow us to break it cleanly and we'll have a look at cutting it in a moment or two you could use something like this like an ordinary chisel the chances of it wandering offline though are pretty good because it's only got a bevel on one edge whereas this has got a bevel on both in terms of the cutting point anyway first thing to do with the protective cover still on the plastic scribe the line that you want to break it down take the scriber and a good firm straight edge I've got this piece of steel here but basically anything will do that will give you a nice clean cutting line cut on the waist side of the line reasons for that I'll show you in a moment and start off relatively lightly this is 3 mil acrylic, so I want to cut down about a millimeter at least. It means several passes of the scriber, getting progressively more firm as the scribe gets deeper. That way it won't slip. Obviously the more of this you do, the less chance there is of the, of the eventual break being uneven. That ought to do us for the time being. So there's our scribe line. 
to break it we need to break it along a straight edge now given that this is a very relatively small piece of acrylic i could probably just press it there and it would break okay but in order to be relatively sure that it's going to go where i want it to go if it's any longer than that i would need to put something on top to stop the whole thing flexing as I press down on it. You may even need to clamp these uh, two pieces at each end to make sure that there's even pressure right the way along that crack. And all we have to do now is apply some pressure. And there's a nice clean break. That's simple enough and as long as these angles here aren't too acute that will work well. I'll show you what happens though if you try and cut a, uh, an angle which is uh, a little bit too acute and you'll see that the break is nowhere near as clean. So here we are with our piece of acrylic. We're going to try and cut that corner off there and make a triangle out of it. You see the angle here is fairly acute. The angle here is not so. This is a 90 degree angle pretty much, or it's almost 90 degrees like we had before. So that one would break easily. But you see what's going to happen now there's my cutting line here's my scribe lightly at first making sure I go right to the edges now you see how difficult that's going to be when I'm right on this corner so I need to push away a little bit just to make sure I've got all the way to the edge and this is where your cutting edge may slip so be careful there but you can see already unless I'm really careful about going right to the end I'm leaving this piece here relatively uncut the score is there but nowhere near as deep as here so there's our score line we're going to try and break it in the same way we did before We'll use our stiffening block, laying our crease line and bending down on the waist side. And let's see what happens now. Now, can you see that? This is almost certainly going to happen if you try and break at an angle which is too acute. Luckily, we can, because we've broken it on the waist side, cut this piece away later on, either by sanding or by using a bandsaw. There's no way that you'll be able to break that off using any other method and still leave that sharp point. I could try and use a pair of pliers. There's a chance it'll work, but more often than not it doesn't. And you can see what's happened there. We've taken the whole corner away. So important thing is when you're cutting an angle like that, don't even bother. Anything more than about 40, or should I say, smaller than about 45 degrees, you're taking a big risk. Using the cardboard model as a template, I cut the shape I needed from a sheet of acrylic glazing. The straight cuts were easy. The curve was cut using a bandsaw and the bend lines marked on the back of the sheet. The material is actually marked service side on the protective cover. And my research hasn't come up with any good reason for this as the material is the same finish on both sides so I don't think it really matters okay yeah. bending acrylic now acrylic well, sometimes known as perspex or plexiglass um, it bends very well provided you don't try to bend it cold here's a piece of the same material if I try and make a cold bend in it that's what happens. You need to warm it up first. If this were macrolon, otherwise known as polycarbonate, um, I could do that cold bend quite easily. The problem is that polycarbonate, although it's much, much stronger than uh, plexiglass or perspex, it does discolor quite quickly in UV light, which means that it's really not suitable for the sort of things that we want to use it for, i.e. canopy glazing. In the short term it would work, but in the longer term it just goes milky. So we're left with acrylic, plexiglass, perspex, call it what you like. In order to bend this, we have to heat it. That's going to be the line I intend to bend it along. 
and you can see that I've clamped it between two pieces of wood and the inside of the bend has got a small radius sanded onto it to give me a little bit of manoeuvre room if you like for when I bend this over the top. I also need to be able to support this section of it as it pulls because what you get is a, a phenomenon known as spring back where having heated it and bent it to the shape that I need if I let go of it at that stage while it's still hot it will try to recover its original form so I need to do something about that. I need to hold it down in place and depending on what I use to hold it down I can get into trouble. If I use a metal bar or anything like that, that heats up very, very quickly and it can actually melt its way into the surface that I'm trying to bend. The best thing to use is something like this, which is a hardwood batten. I say hardwood because it's very close grained, it's very smooth. If I use something like softwood, then the grain of the wood would be imprinted on the plastic when it's hot and I'd have to heat it up to, uh, to get that out, which is just extra work. So the smoother that you can get this, the better. What I'm going to do now, basically, is with some gloves on, because it will get hot, I'm going to heat up that edge using an ordinary hot air gun until I get to a stage where it becomes plastic and flexible. The issue here is that because I'm moving the heat from one end to the other, I have to be careful that I don't set light to the, <laughs> the structure around it, which I shouldn't do. But if, remember, if you're using plastic or anything like that as a backing, then you're likely to affect that too. When it does start to go, I need to make sure that it's the same temperature all the way along. What tends to happen is that the ends here will cool because they're in contact with colder air, so they won't be quite as flexible as the section in the middle. And that can cause problems. You could get cracks at the end forming and it won't necessarily bend at the same radius or as easily. Because we're going to be bending it down and laying it flat on here, this surface also has to be reasonably flat. But that's going to support the part of the sheet which actually we don't need to bend and we don't want any kind of uh, flexibility introduced into that. Or we get wavy lines and wobbles and stuff like that. So this needs to be kept absolutely flat whilst it cools down. So I'm just going to play the heat gun along that edge and you can see already that the plastic is starting to move of its own accord. And it's trial and error now. Getting a feel for when it's likely to go. Still quite stiff at the moment. Now it's starting to get quite flexible. If we go too far with the heat, we'll start to get bubbles in the plastic, or it could even catch fire. Right, we've now we've got to a point where it's just about to go properly. So I'll let go of it there. And press down with my former keeping this nice and flat and I'm going to hold it there until it cools down. If I release it now it's going to try and spring back as it cools which is not something that we want to happen. This process now takes probably about 10 or 15 seconds and that should be good enough now and there's our bend. You probably can't see but there's a very, very slight raise in the plastic at the ends here because it didn't quite hold the heat the same way that it did on the centre. But it's not a bad bend. And if we carefully take it apart now, That's what we've managed to achieve. It's a straight bend, but you can still see, I think, at the ends, it's a little bit distorted. Not by much. I can live with that. At the other end, slightly better. And the reason it's slightly better is because there was less plastic here to dissipate the heat. So it held onto it a bit more than it did at this end. You can possibly see some distortion there in the corner where it didn't quite form the same radius as the rest of the bend along here. But I still think that's quite acceptable. 
So, the big event comes next. This is where it could all go horribly wrong and ruin the material. Careful preparation will help to reduce the risk, so we need to clamp the perspex tightly to the former where we can to mo remove any chance of things moving around. There's two battens to hold the long edges in place, and two more to prevent the front of the screen from trying to follow the bend of the sides. They wanted the front screen to be flat or as flat as I could keep it. Remove the protective covering and transfer the bend lines to the reverse of the sheet. The edges of the card former have been smoothed by parcel tape and it's ready for heating now. There's no video of me doing that as the whole process was quite tense and I didn't want to be distracted by filming and lighting and all that stuff. So I cut straight to the end result. I'm pretty happy with the way that it turned out. A quick test fit showed that the end result was going to fit very well, with only minimal bending stresses on the final assembly. Side panels would be held in by hardwood rails, which meant that the lower edges had to be heat formed to conform. This needed some careful rigging of battens and formers all clamped together with ratchet straps and stuff, and was probably the trickiest part of the whole process. I'd do it differently next time, I think. As an aside here, this photo shows why I haven't yet proceeded with my Spitfire lookalike sliding good idea. The rear part mechanic is considerably wider than the front part, and even with a few compromises it isn't going to be possible to slide the hood back very much, if at all, because a lower rail, the bit the sliding mechanism will be fixed to, would have to be equally as wide at the front as it is at the back, and short of redesigning the cockpit that isn't possible without doing something strange to the front end. The front of the windscreen is held in place with a contoured panel like the previous screen, but obviously a lot wider. I used the old panel to mark out a new one on very thin aluminium that I got for nothing from a local LIFO printer. With the pattern formed to the front screen, now covered with parcel tape to protect it, it got three coats of PVA release agent for two layers of carbon fibre and the final brushing of epoxy covered in peel ply to make sure there were no dry spots. It also serves to flatten everything out. I had to wait 24 hours between each of those processes, but when everything had cured, I could peel everything apart. I wouldn't recommend doing it like this, actually. The cured carbon filaments are needle sharp, and I should have worn gloves. Anyway, I escaped any punctures and this is how it all looks after a clean up and a paint job. The front contour panel is held in place with Sikaflex adhesive sealant, which is really strong but also slightly flexible, as you might expect from the name. So I hope this will absorb some airframe vibrations because I suspect the one piece screen won't be as solid as a three piece version, as there's no stiffening from any framing. The framing you see is just paint. I did grey first because that's what you'll see from inside then the old English white on top, followed by a black edging tape. I used whiteboard tape and I got 13 metres of the stuff for £2, as opposed to the same tape marketed as car pinstriping tape at five times the price. The final flourish was the edge protection profile, which is self-adhesive and completes the job quite neatly, I think. Here's the finished article fitted with a before and after comparison. I had to wait nearly three weeks before I could flight test it, but here's the result of that. A few points that are pretty obvious. The curve of the side panels is very marked, as is the extra width, but talk about wobbly. In fact, most of this was caused by the camera mount working itself loose, but as you can see, there was enough real wobble on the screen mounted camera to prompt me to remove it before something broke. I was kind of expecting that, that the whole screen would be more flexible. So I made some, oh, well I may add some bracing to the upper corners like I did to the original because I quite like the view the camera gets from up there. The aim of the exercise was achieved. 
it's a lot more comfortable and almost draft free so I may be able to use it over more of the year and I really do prefer the improved views both, both for me and the cameras. Okay, that's the new windscreen. Now for some fun before I take you through a previous experiment this year which didn't work out quite so well. This is a little exercise in trying to catch my own shadow. Those of you who've followed my attempts at air-to-ground photography over the years will know I'm quite keen to try new stuff when the conditions are right. On this particular afternoon the sun was in the perfect place for me to throw my shadow onto the landscape so I went off to find somewhere to make the most of the beautiful blue sky and the clear air. It looks great doesn't it? But harder than I thought to keep the shadow in the shot while not hitting anything. This is all legal by the way, the only living things for miles just speak Welsh. Now, some of you might remember that some of my comments regarding Minisport handling have been directed towards the use of flaps in gusty conditions. The Minisport has flap rods that bring the CAA mandated stalling speed down to 35 knots for an SSDR. That's great, but it isn't always appreciated that this can only be done in relatively calm conditions because the use of flap rods severely restricts the available aileron effectiveness. In other words, a gusty crosswind could leave you with full aileron on a sideways drift that you can't stop and this wouldn't be good. As a result of this revelation, I hardly ever use any flap for landing unless the wind's right down the strip, or there isn't much room. When, actually, I'd just go somewhere else if there's a crosswind near the factory limit of 10 knots. So, without flaps, how can we control the approach speed? There's so much residual thrust from the prop at flight idle that, personally, I need to make a long, flat approach to keep speed down. So long, in fact, that a 777 could probably cut inside me. Well, probably not that bad, but I like to fly tight circuits and at a height that gives me a chance to make the field if the engine quits as I go downwind. This means I have to be able to point at the touchdown without the speed going off the clock. And if I get high, there's no point in trying to get rid of the excess height with a power reduction because it's already as slow as it's going to get. Options now are to momentarily raise the nose to lose speed and get towards the wrong side of the drag curve and thus sink like a stone lower the nose and accelerate immediately beyond central limits, side slip like crazy, or switch the engine off and glide in. Well, the last option I've had to use recently when the throttle cable jammed. I don't recommend it as a regular procedure, particularly if there's a crosswind. Directional control after landing is quite a challenge, with no prop. My usual answer is a side slip, and this works well enough, but in a crosswind means a lot of fast footwork and coordinated controls very near the ground. This isn't very comfortable, but it certainly keeps the tail dragger pilot wide awake. So, on holiday this year, and so as not to waste any time hanging around on the beach, I did some back of a postcard scribbling to work out how I might fit an air brake. I got the idea from a book I recently read by John Isaacs, of Isaacs Fury fame, uh, where he had the same problem with his Spitfire lookalike home belt, home build. This is his solution, and it worked, so maybe I could try it too. And Maybe I could kill another bird with one stone and incorporate a means of dropping a flower bomb. Well, you never know when that might be useful, right? Having done the head scratching while trying to avoid the beach, I got home and started cutting some tin. The container for the flower bomb was made from carbon fibre using an easter egg mould, a lot of cutting to keep the weight down, and a simple operating lever connected by a cable. After a lot of fiddling about, this is how it looked in operation. It moved just as planned, and had absolutely no effect, or rather, the effect it did have wasn't expected. I took some video of the Horus display, which I now can't find of course, but to cut a long story short, all I got with full air brake was a 200 foot per minute reduction in my rate of descent, a 3 degrees lower nose attitude and a trim speed of 55 knots, which is 5 to 10 knots more than I want. 
Now, as I said many times, I'm not a test pilot, so I won't argue the benefits or otherwise of this combination. But to say that, suffice to say that I've removed it and shoved it onto the workshop top shelf for uh, probably later recycling. Anyone got any observations or comments, good, bad or otherwise, on this? I'd be intrigued. OK, to finish, there's a dirt track on top of the moor near us, which I nicknamed the Trail of the Lonesome Pine. Come along with me on an airborne slalom. Bye for now. Maybe see you next time.